So we're um, going to turn to God's Word. We are currently in a series called Big Hearted Church. I really believe that God wants to form us with a big heart, a big heart for one another and a big heart for the community in which he's planted us and a big heart for his world. God has a big heart and he wants us to reflect that big heart. And uh, as we've journeyed in this series, we have seen that a big heart, you, you know, you ask, well, that's all very well saying, let's be big hearted. But what does that mean in accordance with scripture? Well, we've seen how it's meaning to be a gospel, te- a gospel telling community, that, that God has given us good news and he wants us to share that good news. It means being a gospel dwelling community, just being the embodiment and the incarnation, Jesus drew close. He stepped into the mess of our world to be that presence, the presence of God, the glory of God in the darkness. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. We're called to not only just speak the words of good news, but to be the good news of Jesus. So gospel tw- telling, gospel dwelling. Last week we saw that it also means to be generously giving, that that Christ gave everything for us. Christ gave of himself wholly and completely. The, The generosity of God was to give of himself ultimately on the cross. And to be big hearted, to reflect the heart of God, means that we need that spirit of generosity, that we need to give up ourselves where there is need. We need to be open to being the generosity of God. And today we're thinking about what it means to be a grace-filled community, a grace-filled community. So this is part four, a gracious giving church. And if you've got your Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 12 of this chapter This is all about grace, how we can be a grace flowing community. We want to be big hearted. We want to reflect the heart of God. And to do that, we need to be a grace flowing community. And this this, in my Bible, this is entitled this passage, the Lord's grace to Paul. We're going to see grace in action through this passage. This is what Paul writes. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, but that for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We give thanks to God for his amazing word. You know, before his conversion, Francis of Assisi had been known to mock those who were suffering with leprosy. Looking in the direction of their house, which was still over two miles away, he held his nose as if the smell offended him. But now, as Christ had broken into Francis's heart, he began to grow in the grace and the power of God. And upon meeting lepers, God would enable him, rather than to keep them at arm's length, rather than to sneer at them, 
rather than to despise them, actually God began to give him a love for them, enable him to go near them and greet them even with a kiss. Indeed, Francis, filled with compassion, knowing the grace of God in his life, filled with compassion, he would often visit their homes in order to wash them and carefully cleanse the ulcers that covered their skin. Over the years, as people saw the example of this grace and this love and this compassion, many people joined in with Francis. And some of these brothers set up a leper hospital. On one occasion, when Francis was visiting the hospital, he encountered a patient who constantly blasphemed and was violent and was abusive to all who tried to serve him. Francis came across the guy and prayed for the man. Can I pray for you? And then after greeting him, he asked what could be done. And the guy said, wash me all over, for I am so disgusting that I cannot bear myself. Miraculously, as Francis washed the man, his leprosy was healed and he began to weep bitterly and repent of his sins. You know, I truly believe that as the church of God, we are called not to keep people at arm's length, not to despise people, not to judge them, not to look down upon them. We are actually called to reflect the grace of God. If you see this passage that we're looking at today, it starts with a thanksgiving and it closes with a thanksgiving. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And then it says now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In other words, Paul has this overflow of thanksgiving in his life. He absolutely knew how vile and messed up and abhorrent his life was before he met Jesus. He describes himself in this passage, as we'll see, as, as the worst of sinners. And yet once he encountered the grace of God, once he encountered the mercy of God, there was this amazing transformation in his life. There was actually an overflow. Look at how Paul describes it in verse 14. He writes that the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The image here, the grace of our Lord being poured out on me abundantly, the image here is of a river that cannot be contained. Paul has in, in, his, in his mind like a, the river Nile that is flowing and overflowing its banks. He's thinking of a river, maybe the Euphrates, which bursts its banks and carries everything before it, sweeping irresistibly on. Now, historically, the Nile, when it overflows, leads to this fertility. The region around the Nile becomes fertile, crops abound. The surrounding area becomes amazingly fertile. And I think that this is the image of what Paul has here of grace. In other words, he says, when grace abounds, when grace is outpoured, when grace flows, there is an amazing harvest. Actually, we see a crop of grace. What does he say? Along with grace comes faith and love that are with Christ Jesus. In other words, rather than judgment, leading to division, actually what he's saying is grace. Grace is an agent that brings about faith and love, like a river that overflows its banks and brings a great harvest and a great crop. Grace brings faith and love. Paul, Paul knew this. Paul knew this from his own personal experience. This is autobiographical. He's saying, look, Look, I want you to be a grace-filled community because this is the grace that I've experienced in my own life. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Paul knew the background of his life. He lists just three things here. He knew that he was a blasphemer. He knew that he was a persecutor. The church were, were, were afraid of this man. They were afraid of him. And, and actually, Paul says, I was a violent man. I was a violent man. That's, that's who he was. That's who he was. He knew he was a bad man. He knew he was undeserving. He knew, he knew that, that God had every right to flick him off the planet and be done with him. And that's what was so amazing. That was, that was what was so amazing in his life when he experienced the mercy of God rather than the wrath of God. It had an amazing effect on him. And in turn, as God cleaned him up and set him on a different path, it brought about this amazing harvest. This is the grace of God. And Paul is basically saying to this church, look, you're living in a world of messed up people. Just open your eyes, look around at the community. Don't judge them. Don't turn your back on them. Don't despise them. Don't sneer at them. Don't look down upon them. Just love them. Love them. Show them grace. Embrace them. Embrace the untouchables. Um, embrace the unlovables. Embrace people that even just make your skin crawl. I mean, my dad was a prison chaplain for many years. And, and every prisoner that came into Norwich Prison uh, had to start with a, a visit from the chaplain or someone from the chaplaincy team. Do you know, I mean, I think my dad's quite a gracious, loving bloke, but he would say to me that there were prison cells that he had to enter where he knew what the bloke had done on the other side of those bars. And he said, it made me sick to my stomach to know what they'd done. But that person needed the love and the grace of God. And so I went in that cell and I shared Jesus. And, and, and that's what it's about. This is, this is the flow of God. This is the flow of God that when a person experiences grace, it leads to an overflow of grace. That's what I'm talking about here. An overflow of grace. We are so thankful that we've experienced grace in our lives, knowing what we've done, that then we ask the Lord, Lord, would there be an overflow of grace to those around us? And so... And so our theme today is to be a grace flowing community. That's a vision, isn't it? Can we be a channel of God's grace? And so my question this morning is, how do we nurture that? How do we nurture that? If that's a, if that's a vision that, that Paul sets before Timothy as he's looking after the churches in Ephesus, uh, how, how, do we, how do we become a grace flowing community? How do we nurture grace? And I think that from this passage, there are kind of three keys that Paul, I think, from his own testimony brings to us in this passage. So first of all, how do we nurture grace? The first point is humility. Humility. The minute we start thinking we're better or judging others, we place ourselves above people. What did Jesus say? The son of man did not come to be served, did not come to lord it over. Like the Gentile leaders, he said, lord it over their people. No, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I think, I think the essence, this is how we're positioned. And I think this is what Paul, I don't think for one minute, Paul just kind of did a tarry chart about his sins against everybody else. When he says, I'm the worst of sinners. He just says, look, I was a bad man. I was messed up. I am no better than the next person is what he's saying. I'm as bad as anyone. I'm as bad as anyone. And I think the essence is this. We minister and we serve and we are community from the position that none of us are sorted. 
None of us have it all together. None of us are worthy. Paul knew he was undeserving. He knew he was not worthy of the role to which God had called him. He knew that. And so he said that to be a grace-flowing community comes from a position that we're no better than the next person. We need, what does is, what is scripture say? All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're, in the same, we're all in the same sinking boat. We all need the love and the grace and the mercy of God. And when we've received that, why would we not offer it? Paul says, look, I, I'm not worthy to be a servant of God. He says, the only reason I'm able to minister as an apostle is because of God. And he identifies two things about this call on his life. He first of all recognizes it's the Lord who has given him strength. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. There's two things in this, there's two things in that verse that suggest that he knows what his role is. First of all, he recognizes that the strength has to come from God. Paul says, look, I, 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 can't, I can't do this in my own strength. I'm, if God is using me, it's because he has strengthened me, not because I am able in my own right. So the first thing we recognize is that this, this, this position of service comes from this position of humility, knowing that we can't do it, that it's only God in us doing it. And then he talks about service. He says, actually, the role to which I'm called is one of service. And the word, the Greek word that he uses here is called diakonia, diakonia. Now we're quite familiar with that word, although you might not realize it because it's where the word deacon comes from. And we know that deacon means to serve. In fact, later on in Timothy, Paul is going to share the type of character that is required for this type of service when appointing leaders in the church. And so Paul is saying, look, I can, only, I can only be in this role because of God's strength. And I recognize that this role is service. And so to be a grace flowing church is to know that, is to know to have the humility that recognize we can't do this in our own strength. It has to be God's strength. And that the role is one of service. Come back to it. For the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The starting point of grace flowing comes from a point of service. It flows out of a gratitude for all that Christ has done for us and then a life of service towards others. Do we have a heart to serve those around us? That's what this verse presents to us as a question. Do we have a heart to serve others? Do we have a heart to serve those we don't like? Do we have a heart to serve those that we struggle to love? Paul says, look, I can only do this in the strength of God, but this is what he's called me to, a life of service. So the starting point is humility, um, which is not easy, but then we get an even difficult, an equally difficult word, which is patience. The second ingredient, oh, these aren't good, are they? Humility is not easy. Patience is even worse, isn't it? Good things take time. Um, look at verse 16. Paul goes on to say, I was shown mercy in me, the worst of sinners, that Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. The reality is, Paul says, grace requires patience. Oh, put your hand up if you hate patience. I, I hate it. It's like, ugh. Um, but God is patient. Paul says, look, God has been patient with me. And therefore, out of grace, even if people are difficult to love, we need to be patient with other people. That's what it means to be a grace flowing community, to have the patience of God. You see, God, sorry, grace understands and recognizes the patience of God. What are we saying here is that, that, that discipleship 
actually coming to God and being transformed by God is a journey that is a lifelong journey, isn't it? It's a lifelong journey. God's work in our lives is ongoing. I think God knows what we are like. We are stubborn, we are arrogant, we are proud, we are willful. That's what we're like. That's our sinful nature. That's what we're like. And so allowing God to work out his transformation in our lives becomes a lifelong journey, doesn't it? And yet God is patient with us. Paul writes elsewhere that we are his workmanship. And the idea there, the word for workmanship is masterpiece. And the image is that God is like a, an artist in our lives, like a sculptor. And he, he works patiently with us, shaping and forming the clay, knocking the, knocking the bad bits off us, just working, working like a, a potter with the clay until that, that clay reaches that point of completion where we are presented to the Father in glory. And so even in the work of Paul, we see that it took time to lead Paul to the cross and then it took a patient work with Paul after the cross. And I actually think that sometimes God is more patient with us than we are with other people. In fact, I think sometimes he gives us people to test our patience because he wants to grow our patience. To be a grace flowing church means that we need to show the patience of God with those around us. Not to judge, but just to allow God to work out his patient artistry in the lives of those around us. And we need to help nurture that. If God is patient with us, then we need to replicate that patience as well. In other words, we're called to embody the patient heart of God as a church. Is that easy or is that difficult? Think about Paul himself. This is his testimony. We often think that Paul's conversion was sudden. And there is no denying that on the Damascus Road, there was a dramatic event, a dramatic moment. But it's also important to recognize that the Holy Spirit was at work in Paul's life prior to the Damascus Road, and that there was a good number of years after, a good number of years of formation after his conversion, prior to being called into God's service. And, and it was understandable that the church was a little bit offish with Paul, wasn't it? I mean, they, they didn't trust him to begin with. Why? Well, because he was arresting them, beating them up, and murdering them. Do you know what I mean? So suddenly Paul's come to church in that morning. People are going to be a bit nervous, aren't they? I think that there are people that could, is it not true that there are people that could walk through these doors now that could make the church feel a little bit nervous? It's true, isn't it? Somebody could walk in and we're all a little bit nervous and then everybody looks at the minister and thinks, what are you going to do? I don't know, I'll just carry on preaching. <laughs> you know, it's difficult. And Paul was one of those people, and this is what he's saying. When I walked into church, the welcomers were not that welcoming. And yet, there were two people who allowed grace to flow. Two people who were patient. One was Ananias. The Holy Spirit said to Ananias, go and minister to Paul. And Ananias said, isn't that the guy who's the murderer? And the Holy Spirit just go, minister to him. And he laid hands and ministered to Paul and Paul's sight was restored and, and, and he looked after him, he fed him, showed him hospitality. Ananias was God's agent of hospitality to the violent man. It's amazing. And then there was Barnabas. Barnabas actually was the bridge builder. Barnabas was amazing. Look at Acts chapter nine, verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, that's Paul, but they were all afraid of him. He didn't get the welcome that he wanted, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas, this was the bit, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord 
and that the Lord had spoken to him. I think God wants us all to be like Barnabas. Rather than rejecting Paul, rather than keeping him at arm's length, both Ananias and Barnabas journeyed with him. They embraced him. They were gracious. They, they, they just gave him time to journey and for the work of the Lord's Holy Spirit to work in him and through him. But ultimately, it led to a harvest. Do you know, isn't it amazing that, that Barnabas reached out and just gave him time, but then God used Paul so amazingly? That's the vision. That's the harvest. That's the flow. That's the river Nile of grace. And so we're just almost there. Humility, patience, and love. That's the third thing. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Do you know, ultimately, this is about loving unlovable people. And recognizing that perhaps before I think of someone else being unlovable, I myself was unlovable first. A um, powerful example of this made the headlines in 2003 when a rector intervened in an angry and venomous exchange between the settled residents of the Cambridgeshire village of Cottenham and the traveling community who lived at the nearby Smithy Fen. Slowly but surely in a long process that sought to encourage a constructive dialogue between the two groups, it was a rector, a vicar, a vicar called Michael Hoare, who helped them to understand each other's hopes and fears, and it brought about transformation. Why? Because there was one guy there who, rather than keeping a community at arm's length, was willing to love and willing to listen. And so there we have it. There we have it. We are called to reflect the grace of God. We're called to be a grace flowing community. And I know that Jesus knows that this isn't easy for a church, for any church. Because it's uncomfortable, that's really why. And so I've asked the question from this passage today, how do we nurture grace? And they're simple things, but they are not easy. First of all, it requires humility, recognizing that I am no better than my brother or my sister. Secondly, it requires patience. Loving unlovable people is really difficult. It's a journey. And yet God has been gracious to do that with us. God is gracious to journey with us. We should be gracious to journey with others. And finally, it just comes from a heart of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever, however they are, wherever they're from, may not perish, but have eternal life. What do you reckon? Do you think God could shape us to be a grace-flowing church? What do you reckon? Let's pray together. Let's pray. Let grace overflow. Amazing grace. How can it be? Amazing grace. Father, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We know that we don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. Father, help us to be that grace-flowing community. Let there be an abundant overflow of grace in our communities. Open our eyes, Lord, to those on the margins. Open our eyes to those that are despised. Open our eyes to those that are judged and help us to allow a river of your grace to flow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm not pretending that's easy at all, all right? But with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Let's close by singing.